Kate Share here. So at, while I was making this video, I was thinking to myself, what would be a really good getting to know you type video? Then I started thinking, well, what's the first thing that usually a new person I come across should know about me? And the first thing that usually comes to mind is how much I'm obsessed with the world of Disney. Imagine something up there. So that's when I realized, hmm, maybe I should tell you guys what my favorite Disney movies are. And trust me, I love a lot of them. So I try to make this list as short as possible by a couple things. One, I'm not, like, the maximum I decide to go is 13 movies because I think that the unluckiest number should be the luckiest of all in cases like these because you don't want to go too many as 15 because that's too much to explain and there's so little you could do with top fives, top tens to pretty much explain all of that. So that's what I chose and as far as this list goes, these are not movie reviews. So I'm not going to review as to why this movie's good or why this movie's bad. This is a list that just says the what's and the why's of I like this movie. And everyone has their different opinions. You don't have to like these movies. In fact, this is just a video saying why I personally like these. So everyone, everyone's opinions are different, especially mine, which is why I'm doing this list. And who knows? Maybe we find some similarities. And if you have any movies that I haven't mentioned in this list, which you will you can sp find out at the end, you could just put them in the comments and tell me why that's what one of your favorite movies. And if you have common interests, care to share. So without further ado, this is the t Getting to Know Me, my top 13 favorite Disney films of all time. Finding Nemo. Okay, for those of you who grew up around this time period, I want you to go back to the year 2003, or even 2002, and remember the time when Finding Nemo was literally everywhere. Like, I remember I was a kid in Magic Kingdom, and they literally had a promotional parade. Basically advertising everyone to go see this movie. Like, I didn't know such a little film was gonna get so much recognition until basically I saw the movie in theaters. And then I realized, even when, how old was I in 2003? Eight? Seven? Yeah, I didn't know, like, who knew for a seven or eight year old I would be so interested in su in such a little Pixar film? And this was when 3D was kind of becoming the newest thing. It's become well, DreamWorks started really using it around this time period because Pixar started using it in the late 90s. So this was when the ball was still st starting to get rolling, and like, maybe because this movie was everywhere, people actually started to dislike Finding Nemo, but that goes to the question, why do I love this film so much? Well, well, besides the fact that Ellen DeGeneres almost basically makes this entire film because Dorius becomes such an influential character, and we just got hurt their sequel, our sequel, Finding Nepo's sequel, 13 years later, which I'll get to later. Like, this little film, it's like one of those hidden gems that, for Disney, they've been planning for a while, but they were looking for the right time to actually express, to actually exploit it. Like, when, like, for a kids' film, like, I'm, 
not just films in general, but for a kid's film, when was the last time you saw a movie that was focused around a parent, or more particularly, a father who literally goes out of his way to find or protect his child? And why I say that is because we all knew back in the 90s, The Secret of Nim was one of the first children's films that little that expressed this idea idea of a parent going out of his or her way to protect or or basically save their children from disaster that is to come. And then in 2003 you get a film literally about a father whose son gets kidnapped and he basically conquers his fear of the ocean just so he can get his son back. And that story within itself, that should have been an inspiration more than pro anything else Disney has produced. Because when people think Disney, they mostly pr think of the, I don't know, the 13 princess films out of the, out of the almost 100 majority. Like, like it's about, it's about all these happy endings and such, but I think sometimes people forget that there's str internal struggle and some sort of, like, character development that goes along with it. And when it comes to Finding Nemo, it does just that. Because you have Marlin, who, straight up from the beginning of the film, lost his wife and the majority of kids due to a barracuda attack, and then time rolls by and he tries his best to make sure his only surviving son, Nemo, doesn't suffer the same fate. But it's because of this overprotection that it happens anyway. So what's the only way else to solve this problem? Is to actually go out there and conquer your fears and set things right. And I don't know if people, people really... Re recognize that or even remember that aspect but as as I grew up I becoming more of an adult I realize if you really love your child that much like any par any parent with a child would they would literally go out their way to do anything to make sure their child comes home especially when they've been kidnapped or they've gone missing so I think it's that message alone that really makes me adore this film. Lilo and Stitch. Speaking of being everywhere, before we had Finding Nemo, we had this little film from 2002. Like, it was, like, Disney was really b banging into everyone's heads that this was gonna be one of Disney's greatest film that they literally took, took clips from their other movies and just inserted Stitch in there. Which, now that I'm older, I'm like, really Disney, did you really have to do that? Because, well, basically they were banging at the fact that Stitch is going to be one of those characters that everyone's going to remember. That because of his qu little quirks and his little personality that Stitch is going to going to be sh or share the same level as Mickey and friends and much to my surprise They were totally right Because if you look in the parks now like if you go to Tomorrowland in Disney World slash Disneyland and the moment people see Stitch they literally run towards him and tell him how adorable he is and that even though he's a little bit bad, there's still some good in him. Which leads me to the messages of the movie, which I believe make this movie a lot more deeper than it was supposed to be. Like, on the outside, you see this as a sci-fi sort of action flick, because you have an alien who basically escaped from being imprisoned because he was illegally made according to the laws of the alien government or something like that. But then he ends up meeting this little girl and basically uses her, 
her her family and her house as refuge to get away from these two other aliens who are basically hunting him down. And then, of course, you have action scenes later on down the line. But in the in-between scenes, it's... Like, those little scenes are make, actually make the movie a lot more quieter and have deeper meaning because... Before Stitch enters Lilo's life, she's basically struggling with the grief because she and her sister just lost their parents. And I mean both of their parents. And her older sister, Nani, is basically trying to tell social services that she can take care of Lilo by herself. But Lilo's already hard to take care of as it is because... She, because she gets picked on a lot, and of course that makes her get, go into these little outrages and pick fights with people. And even though Nani's trying to be the parent, but she has to remember she's also Lilo's sister. So it's kind of hard to see the fine, fine line between sister and guardian, in a sense. Because in Lilo's mind, Nani's just her sister. And... She doesn't really expect her to be in charge of everything, even despite her parents not being there anymore. So, I believe that the internal struggle with the sisters here, it's a lot better and fluctuated than I think Frozen ever did. Like, you take such a complex problem, and when Lilo and Stitch does it perfectly, Frozen just adds all this other nonsense. Well, this like fantasy type, no fantasy type nonsense where um, you, where you have like, oh, it, like the main reason why they're really apart is that Anna wants to marry some guy she just met, but because Elsa hasn't been there, she doesn't. Anna doesn't think Elsa knows everything. Okay, but the okay, but like I said, with Lilo and Stitch. This, the conflict is real. It's a more realistic situation. You just lost your parents, and things have to be different. And in order for you to stay together, Nani has, like, had to grow up too fast a little bit. Like, if anything, Nani should be having fun with her friends and probably be going to college and stuff. But she can't because, or else her little sister will be alone. And if Nani's not the respectable guardian that she is... Lilo's going to be taken into foster care or something, and she's going to be taken to a family who doesn't even know her. And and like I said, Lilo's already a struggle as it is, has an internal struggle as it is. So, a lot of people say, like, my, or maybe a few people say that the bond between the sisters should already have been a movie, a separate movie as it is. But I believe if you did leave out Stitch, then, then, like, the, nothing's gonna be solved. There's nothing, there's no, like, external thing to come in to, the, to fix everything. And despite Stitch coming in there for his own selfish purposes, he does end up changing both of these sisters' lives and in a very good way. And he comes to learn himself that just be just because you were programmed to literally t take away everything from these simpletons like everything is a lot more complex than you think and life is more living in the moment or ha having literally the little that you have is more important than literally taking over everything and you think being happy just that like Stitch literally gained more purpose being in Lilo and Nani's lives than just doing what he was programmed to do and over time and even in some deleted scenes that I discovered over YouTube Stitch becomes more and more complex and that little speech at the end just puts everything in place and Despite what people say about it sometimes, like, if the science fiction elements were not even there, then the movie would have been better. I think with the science fiction elements in such a dramatic setting, it, total, it totally works. Like, I mean, it, it's a kid's movie. It's gonna be a little bit corny, but 
it's the courtiness that really adds to the heart and the sadness that this movie kind of has. And it's a lot, it's a little bit more depressing than what's been laid out on the surface. So I guess I like this movie. Because, well, what really does this movie in for me is its instrumental tracks. I'm not really going to say soundtrack because the majority of the soundtrack is just Elvis Presley songs. But whenever there's an instrumental piece put, thrown in there, it fits the scene. It really gets down to the core of what's happening. And I, I bless the man responsible for creating those tracks because that's why those, like, few songs were my favorite from this movie, and I can't help but, like, hum the tunes in my head and c continue to watch this movie, even, even as I'm older. Like, I was probably, like, six or seven years old when this film came out. Like, I just thought this was a little, oh, it's a, it's a little alien trying to be a dog type thing. But even though that... That's like, this plot device is so cliche. Disney knew how to make it original. Like, they added the internal struggles going on with the family so that the little pet, disguised pet creature can change something in the end. And in the end, something was changed and things did turn out better for Nani and Lilo in the end, which makes the idea all the more original. And... I know in later later movies like How to Train Your Dragon, directors knew that in order to take a, such a cliche concept, you have to put something in there that grabs the audience and n to not make them say, oh, it's another like alien creature or mythical creature disguised as a pet or they have to keep it hidden or else something bad's going to happen type deal. Disney did do that, and, like, for such a film that was so popular back then, but now has, like, kind of dropped to the lower classic level, I think it's kind of sad, because even as a, in the storytelling as a whole, this film does, does its justice, and, and it's an original story, like, there's no, nothing else that could top Lilo and Stitch to make it better than it already is. And that's what I really be that's what I really believe as one of, one of my favorite fi one of my favorite films. Tangled. You know one of those movies that you or maybe fairy tale stories that you think you really know the story about, but then when one company decides to do a retelling that kind of changes everything you know, but it really makes sense. I think Tangled really does that. And I mean that in ways that you change a couple of elements as to why this happens, that type of thing. It completely, totally works. Well, for starters, Rapunzel wasn't a kidnapped peasant girl that the witch takes away because of whatever circumstances. She was actually a born princess, which adds into the whole Disney princess franchise deal to begin with. But Rapunzel didn't even know, well, kind of like Sleeping Beauty, she didn't even know she was a princess until something happens. But unlike Sleeping Beauty, she wasn't told this. She actually figured out figured it out by herself because through, because for 18 years of her life the witch Gothel basically keeps her in that tower and does not let her out for anything because she's afraid if Rapunzel finds out about the outside world and leaves then the powers that she has in her hair will be out of her grasp and mother Gothel will eventually die. Well, speaking of, speaking of which, like, and Rapunzel doesn't have her long hair because the witch needs it to climb the towers always, but because Rapunzel has youth powers in her hair that were caused by a flower that her mother had to drink because she was sick, and those pa and that flower also had 
special healing ab abilities. So, because of, because of this, that's the more the reason Rapunzel is forced to stay in there. And when she finally gets out, it's not a prince that takes her out. He's actually, um, Flynn Rider is actually a thief, a petty thief, who thinks the, the only way to be satisfied in life is to steal everyone's riches and keep them for himself. And actually, I think what makes this movie, most of all, is the couple that ends up together, like, I know, like every other Disney princess movie ever, the princess needs a prince, blah, blah, blah. There's a love story. But the love story actually works. It's not forced or anything. Because you have Flynn who's trying to run away from the guards. And he ends up finding Rapunzel's tower by mistake. And soon as they meet, the only way he can get um, his stolen treasure back is if... He takes Rapunzel out to see the one thing she's always wanted to see, which were the lanterns that were actually set up for her went by her by her king and queen parents when she was kidnapped in the first place because they hoped that the lanterns would one day bring Rapunzel back home, which it do which it does in a sense, but it doesn't really bring it doesn't really bring her home until the very end. Which, maybe I, maybe I should put up a spoiler alert before this. Actually, you know what? I'll post it now. Spoiler alert. Thank you. Maybe you guys knew that from the, from the get-go, but anyways. So, with Flynn and Rapunzel, like, throughout this entire journey, it's a, it's a more as to why they're, they want their goals to be settled as to always... Oh, I want this because I want this. And Rapunzel does bring up a really good point by saying, My dream is about to be fulfilled here when they finally go see the lights. But what's going to happen after that? I got what I wanted, but what do I do? And then you have Flynn saying, You go find a new dream. That's what life is all about. And that's where the point really stands. It's because no one really has just one dream basically because when one because when you do fulfill something what's the point of living after that then life is going to be boring because you had that one thing done so when Flynn does end up saying oh you just go find a new dream because that's his way of saying you have to live life in the fullest just by having multiple things to do in life. That's why bucket lists exists. And and because these two have their sort of backstories, even though Rapunzel doesn't really remember most of it in the beginning, because remember, she was kidnapped when she was a baby. That was all she know that's all she grew up with. But then she but these two really learned about each other that Rapunzel hasn't really been out to explore anything, so she doesn't really know much about the outside world more than Flynn does. Because Flynn's been an orphan for the majority of his life. He's he literally has to steal to survive. I don't know, kinda like Aladdin kind of stealing from that. But But then he realizes from Rapunzel that it's just because you don't really have much riches, what's really fulfilling is the What's more fulfilling is just the will to live and discover new things. And and literally, Rapunzel had nothing. Like, of course, Mother Gothel would give her all these material things just to keep her from being bored. But all Rapunzel really wanted was just to explore the outside world. Just to be like everybody else. She didn't want to be trapped in one place for the rest of her life then. That would definitely be more boring if you just had all the material things instead of the external things. Like, literally going out in the sun, literally talking with people, literally going to see everything else that everyone else, everyone else takes for granted and everything. Like, for Rapunzel, she doesn't really take want to take those for granted. She just wants to be like 
everybody else. And though this story is also kind of a metaphor, or an internal metaphor for child abuse in a sense, which, yeah, Disney, thanks for trying to be blunt, but it's not really that blunt. Well, actually, no, vague. I'm, I meant vague. Ugh, I can't English today. I know I'm an English major and I can't even English. But yeah, Disney was very blunt when it comes to their some of their messages. I mean, take a look at Zootopia. But but otherwise, the character development is there. Plus, when you got Mandy Moore as Rapunzel, God bless her singing voice, and everything involved with it. Speaking of the soundtrack, I love it so much. And my and of course my favorite song is your favorite song, I See the Light. The one song that would get a would get awards because of how beautiful it is. And I think it has to be one of the best um couples love like love songs from Disney that I've heard in a while. Because it's not real because the love song's not really about how forward their romance is it like this song is based on their internal thoughts like Rapun Rapunzel sings about how she finally is here and she got what she wants but what makes it better is that she's here with someone to share it with and Flynn does end up enjoying this experience as well but what makes it all the better is that he actually made someone happy. And, of course, he's looking at Rapunzel, who's smiling the entire time. He, she doesn't even have... She doesn't even frown at all. Like, you can tell how happy she is. And the fact that Flynn is there watching how happy she is. Like, all the goodness that she has, which is what he would re would really rather, rather want than all these riches... But this is what changes Flynn's op opinion about what life or what his dream should be. Which really plays a huge role in the end of the film. Which, I think everybody knows what happens at the end, but I'm not going to spoil it for the sake that I've already spoiled it enough. But, I wish there was more I can say, but this film is really almost as perfect as something like Beauty and the Beast, where... The character development was on point, like, the story events are on point, the villain was on point, the music is on point, like, everything about this film was completely on point, and there's no- I wish there was more I could say, but this is just one of those perfect films that I really enjoy and love so much. Brave. So we come to Pixar's very first Disney princess film. And for a princess film, this was definitely done a lot more differently than from the Disney, Disney princess films that we've seen in the past. For one thing, this is, and I highly doubt this is going to be a spoiler for anybody, but this is the first princess film that the princess doesn't end up with any love interest at all. Not that... They don't get married at the end of the film or anything, but she just doesn't have one. Like, n no moment does she ever say, Oh, I want this person to be my husband or to be my prince, blah, blah, blah. Like, if anything, Merida was completely against m marriage for the longest time. So, what is this movie about? It's like, what is the type of story that Brave really is? If anything, Brave is a story between, actually, a daughter and her mother. Like, I know, we really don't get stories like that, because if you follow the Disney formula long enough, rarely ev any, like, Disney film has the mother alive while the main character is alive, if need be. So... How did, Di did, did Disney accomplish what had to be accomplished? Actually, I have to say yes. Because straight from the get-go, from the start of the film, you see Merida and her mom and what the relationship was like before Merida grew up and change started to happen. Like, so you know straight from there what the story was going to be about. Which, 
I appreciate Disney for because they really stuck through with what they wanted to present. So, of course, you have Merida, who is basically a tomboy princess. Like, she is more like her father. Like, she would rather be a person who's fighting and shooting arrows and spending time out in the forest on her own free will instead of doing all these womanly things like, well, not exactly being polite because she is polite in some sense. But she hate, but she doesn't like wearing tight dresses. She does. She doesn't like music that much, or she doesn't. She didn't. She doesn't like trying to speak properly in a way that's uncomfortable for her. But then, of course, you have her mother, who just wants to make sure that her daughter knows how to rule a kingdom properly and can be able to stand out on her own. And of course, with situations like these, you know, the mother can be overbearing. And that's exactly what happens in this movie, which leads to the con- which, which leads to the conflict of her mom basically being turned into a bear because Merida accidentally put a curse on her. So then the whole story is, how do we change mom back to normal before her father finds out because her father's not fond of bears in the slightest due to some event that happens five minutes into the film. So, so, and during this process, we finally get that mother-sister bond that they practically lost all those, all those years ago because Merida grew up and she wanted to be her own person, but her mom was like, this is totally going out of my plan. So... What I really like about this film is that a lot of the ways both of them do end up learning about something. Like, Merida does learn that some of her mother's te teachings are exactly important, especially if that means bringing the world back in or or the kingdoms back in order. So she does end up using those to tell her father and the other kings that if... Like, if the kingdoms want to be together, they have to not bond by marriage, but basically bond by allyship and friendship of the story that, mo that her mother used to tell her all the time, which really is put into play in this film. Like, her mother would not tell it for no reason whatsoever. And then, of course, the mother does learn that sometimes being... Like, the, or the fe stereotypical feminine is not the way to solve things, especially when it comes to protecting her daughter from the outside elements. Like, sometimes you do have to get down and dirty in order to solve a problem, especially when it comes to getting attacked. And just beca and because these two finally get to learn about each other, they can finally restore that bond that they had when Merida was a little girl. And... In the movies, just to tell you that even when you grow up, a relationship with your parents in general is not impossible. Like, if you learn to understand each other and where both of your idea new and old ideas come from, it is possible to still hold that relationship that you guys had long ago. It still can it still can basically exist, and I love how and I love how this movie is portrayed because. I will not not to say whether this is a, exactly a problem, but it do, it's a coming of age story that does need to be expressed along the lines because I don't know what teenager rebe doesn't rebel against their parents like from from time to time. Like I was a teenager once. Just just me. I was a teenager once, and by seeing this movie, like. It's actually one of my mom's favorite films, too, because of the message and everything that it has. And I know I'm saying that a lot of these films that I like go by message-wise and pretty much nothing else. But is that exactly a bad thing? No, I mean, the characters are also very well-developed, even though... Actually, yeah. Yeah, okay, I'm, this is where I'm gonna go down with this here. Actually, the only two developed characters in this movie are Merida and the mother because 
that's what the story is based around of. But of course you get, of course you have, like, the four kings, one of them being her dad. But her dad's kind of like the goofball of the situation. And you know he loves his daughter. You know he really does. And it's kind of like when it comes to her daughter's decisions, he kind of doesn't have a lot of power. But he does um, talk with his wife when it comes to trying to understand Merida, Merida, as he does. So I think that's one downside of it. And the music is okay. Like, it doesn't have much vocal track. Like, it has only one song. But the, sound, but the instrumentals were also pretty good. And, and like, the 3D, and the 3D animation, as Pixar always does, it's always amazing. I only wish I could see more, but it is definitely the message that really stands out and as to why I really love Brave so much and why it stands as this position on this list. Wally. Oh boy, where do I even start with this one? Okay, when I was a kid, around this time when this movie came out, was it like 2008 or so? Like, when the trailer first came out, it was just Wally being Wally. Like, there was literally no talking in it whatsoever. And I remember being a kid and I'm like, Really, Pixar? You're trying to entertain kids with literally no human dialogue whatsoever? But for some odd reason, people were very intrigued by it, and they, they were left w wondering, I want to know more about this little film that looks like a short film, more than a movie that would take an hour and a half to tell a story about. Nothing really came out to the imagination until the opening day of the film's release was inching near and more trailers and more commercials were coming out. And of course, yes, these ones had um, human dialogue in it. They had English, English words in there somewhere. So that's when people were like, okay, now we know more about what this is about. And then by the time people saw this movie, they were like, Oh my god, I did not expect this. And I guess partially the reason why I love this movie is because, for me, it was an element of surprise. Like, a definite element of surprise. And also, it's another one of those movies where the message is literally in your face, and it's very blunt. Of course, this movie was made around the time where um, global warming was a huge issue, and that, of course, in the 2000s or late 2000s, the environment was becoming more and more relevant. But in comparison to all the other environment type movies, I think what makes Wally -E so unique is that it's not the message as is not exactly as in your face as the others are. Because, yeah, everyone everyone does talk about how our environment's an issue, but the main purpose of the story is it's in the point of view of this little garbage collector robot who's the last of his kind because all the other robots broke down while humans were in outer space trying to enjoy themselves. Literally, I mean, well, yes, indulge themselves. But then... So, but then something happens in his life where he meets Eve, who's literally a robot who's like, whose job it is is to search for plant life because her supposed directive is to bring the humans back home and to help cultivate Earth as it once was. Because the moment you enter this movie, like literally the skyscrapers are made out of garbage blocks that Wally made himself and all the rest of the skyscrapers are kind of like torn apart. Like, it's literally barren. And the subtlety of this movie actually really works because ever since this movie came out, it was just as popular as Finding Nemo was back in 2003. Like, I didn't expect such a very little film or like short film type atmosphere thing to have such an impact on a community within itself. Like, 
you don't have to be a Disney fan to know what this movie is. Because the moment you hear the, the title WALL-E, you know what this movie is. Like, be, whether you were watching it in your science class or whatever, or you were watching it at your friend's house or your parents, like, made you, wa made you watch it because it's entertainment for the next hour and a half. But with this, with this movie, like, who, I never knew I would like non-talking characters that much because the first, the first time I ever saw Wally, -E, I was obsessed with that little robot. Like, he's just so innocent and he has no idea what's going on in the world, but at the same time, he, his goal towards the end of the movie is to help fix everything. Like, no one really knew such an innocent little thing would end up being one of the heroes of this movie. Like, you I know you would expect Eve to change everything because it's her mission, it's her job, but it just proves that even, like, technology could be more intelligent than humans as to stand up, stand up to the task, that type of deal, I guess. Because, I mean, there are important human characters, too, but they're, I don't want to say lesser, but they're more as, this is like the first movie that the humans become more background characters. Or maybe, maybe not exactly the first time, but of course in a Disney film, the humans become more as background characters in a world where humans were the responsible, like, creating robot technology. And of course it's the robot technology that knows how to, s knows more about what the humans really need than the humans themselves. And it does teach that if we're going into the direction as the movie the movie went, like our lives could basically be exactly what Wally presented. And in a way, Disney kind of scared us a little into changing things. Like like now we have more um anti no, not we have like anti garbage, like more pro environment type laws. We like more and more people are going into fitness the fitness, that type of thing, in order to stay, um, themselves. I think this, like, what I think is, this movie what was, like, life-changing for the late 2000s, going into the 2010s, especially when it comes to taking care of our planet. And I think this movie did more justice than something like Fern Gully, which turns out to be one of the most infamous movie environmental movies in history but with with Wally -E, I think if the message didn't really get me enough it was definitely Wally -E and Eve as characters because because for something that for things that don't really talk that much they really can convey what the story what what's going on in the story like they do tell you something is wrong without even, even kind of really expressing what is wrong. It's not, no, not, like, this, the last thing Wally does is spoon feed you. Like, Wally doesn't really spoon feed you what's happening. And it's one of those subtle story details that, as a sto storyteller's point of view, Disney has really done right, and this is why I think Disney is one of the greatest storytellers of all time. It is definitely because of this movie, and that's why it deserves the spot on this list. Saving Mr. Banks. Finally, we get to a live action Disney film. I know, it's been prolonged long enough. Actually, Saving Mr. Banks is definitely one of those movies, kind of like Wally, -E. it's full of surprises or things that you didn't really expect to come out of a Disney film. Like, for one thing, when I heard this film was in the process and I heard Tom Hanks was going to play Walt Disney himself, my first reaction was like, oh my god, really? Like, are you serious? But the moment I first saw Tom Hanks' character, well, Walt Disney character anyway, the first time he appears, I didn't know it was Tom Hanks at all. Like, the makeup was done- the makeup and costuming was done so good, I didn't even notice it was even Tom Hanks. Even though, I guess you know it's an actor, but because of how they look, you- I guess you didn't even notice? 
that was when I knew, okay, okay, I think I can at least tolerate this film. But then you have Emma Thompson as P.L. Travers. Oh my god, I think, I think her performance saved this movie. Like, yeah, like you, for, like, for Emma Thompson, I don't think she could do any wrong. And to play the woman who wrote the whole Mary Poppins children's series, this, this performance definitely takes the cake. Actually, for all, like, biography type films that Disney has done, half of me feels that Saving Mr. Banks feels more candid and more truthful than any other ones. It's not a documentary. Like, it's most definitely not a documentary or else Walt Disney would probably be like, I don't know, 100, 100 something years old by now. And P.L. Travers would probably still be alive, but I digress. This movie... I put it on the list because it definitely has a lot of emotion thrown into the whole process of turning Mary Poppins into an actual film. Like, it was kind of hinted at that P.L. Travers didn't want Disney to get his hands on her series, but with this movie, it gets down to the why. And, you know, I think there's a saying that for every fictional writer, there's some truth hidden in the story somewhere. For this for this movie, you can definitely tell that something was in there. And practically, the Mary Poppins series was practically P.L. Travers' escape to express what happened during her childhood because the Mr. Banks character is actually her representation of how her father was a good man to her in ways more than one. I mean, his problem was that he was an alcoholic straight from the get-go. Like, he lost his old job because of his drunk drunkenness, I guess. And then in the new place they go to... Yeah, yeah, the new place they go to... Go to, like, don't want... Like, I'm gonna say new place because I keep forgetting if it's Australia... I think it's Australia, because if I end up saying New Zealand, I think I'm gonna offend a lot of people. <laughs> so I apologize in advance if I get it wrong. But I highly believe it's Australia. Throughout her childhood, like, like Travers basically grew up probably carrying all the problems that her dad ha had on her back. Because he's trying to provide for the family as much as possible, but as all of you know, alcoholism is basically a disease. And it's really hard to overcome, especially in those times when it's rather try to be dealt with or leave men to it than instead of trying to get help, because obviously nothing really happened. And of course, P.L. Travers had to live with that throughout her life, especially when it came to trying to take care taking care of her mother and her other two, and her two siblings. And you find out that actually Mary Poppins is also based on, on a really import, important person who literally saved the family from even though she hated to say it, her de her dad's like ruining. Which of course, Walt Disney doesn't get because either in ways, of course, P.L. Travers kept this to herself, but at the same time, what Disney tried to do was because children love her books so much, all he wanted to do was tell the story to other people in more ways than just literature. And basically this whole movie is just how P.L. Travers and Disney basically bond over the same exact story. But at the same same time, P.L. Travers is overcoming her guilt how, of how things happened when she was a child. And she wished that everything can just change. And I think rumor has it, or maybe it's true, that P.L. Travers didn't like fully how the movie turned out, but 
I believe that in some light that there there were some scenes that Disney created that literally hit home so that everything tur did turn out fine and that Mary Poppins turned out to be one of Disney's greatest masterpieces to even P.L. Travers can personally agree with. Though I'm not really much an expert on these things, I'm just here because I want to express, first of all, how much I love Mary Poppins and it could be hinted that you'll see that movie later talked about on this list. But as far as um, bio biographical movies go, it's, pardon my little brain fart there, Saving Mr. Banks is definitely a more touchy subject as far as the Disney company is concerned. I mean, I'm sure there are other bio biography movies that touch upon Disney's um life in the animation field, but it's one of, but Saving Mr. Banks is definitely one of those movies that you have to check out for the sake of its heartfeltness and def it's definitely one of those movies that could make you tear up, especially towards the end. Like, I think it's more than likely everyone knows what happens at the end due to, you know, timeline basis, but I highly recommend that you just watch this film for the sake of how some, how sometimes uh, how a writer goes through when her his or her work becomes or becomes something in the media. Because sometimes it's a sometimes you like it, but then sometimes you find out reasons why you don't want to, and this is definitely one of those movies that you gotta go see for the heartfelt emotion. Please, I insist. Up. And to answer your question now, yes, partially the reason why I love this film is the first 10 minutes. And yes, I did cry after the first 10 minutes of that movie. And with good reason, too. Like I said, coming from a storyteller t standpoint, you don't have to tell every single detail that happens. But even a scene could be just played with music and you can definitely feel what the characters are going through and you can tell what's going on by the tone and like whether it's color tone, whether it's music tone, whether it's characters expressions. Like you can you know what a story is about just by those little things and Pixar did a really good job when it came to the first 10 minutes of this movie. But of course, I there's other things to talk about, but I think this review would be well not review, but little talk would be shorter than compared to the others. Basically, this if you don't know what Up is about, it's about this man named Carl who basically wants to fulfill his wife's dream by going to South America and and basically moving his house to where his wife wanted to visit. Of course, since he's old, he wasn't really capable of moving by himself as much as he used to, and before he could actually go on this journey with his wife, she unfortunately passes away. Which, yeah, that contributes to the whole 10 minutes, for those of you who don't know. But when it comes to this movie, a lot of messages go inside it as far as... J just because someone's truest dream did not, or was not fulfilled, doesn't mean that you have to hold on to it. Or you could hold on to it, but make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. And... Of course, this man, after losing his wife, he's become, like, less sat dissatisfied with life. And the only way he could fulfill it was if he did finally go on that adventure that he always had. Though, this is not, this is not always the case. But, but this movie definitely is. And I think what's also my favorite part of this movie is definitely the animation. Like, especially when... Carl goes up into the gets the house flying for the first time as he's traveling throughout the city in such a maybe I should say like dull colored world those balloons that he uses they completely and totally pop and 
just because of background characters interactions with this set animation like you get you just know and you feel like you're watching this house soar like you're you feel as if you're actually a citizen from the city looking up at this new like abnormal thing and you're like wow what is that it's like something from a child's dream that's being fulfilled and in in more ways than one it's one that you want to see it's not it's not like something you can just dismiss as a child's like dumb imagination like just the like all the colors that you see they they actually fit in the movie and of course the character you get all these quirky characters and they actually work in set in such what you think is just a simple plot but knowing disney they made this a lot more complex than you think like and they also insert these little subplots in there that actually intertwine with the adventure that's going on and it definitely works i wish i could say more about this film but i'd probably go on for hours on end and if you have reached this at this point in time i thank you for staying with me through my ramblings but overall just for the animation and the story factor you this is a definitely must watch film like even though this is another movie where like it's another pixar film where it doesn't really explain a lot through its initial trailers but once you see this movie you completely understand why they do it and every single time they do that it definitely works like this movie just works as a whole and i highly recommend you that you watch it just for fun